The breakdown goes undercover. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. We have a great show for you tonight. I'm Tara Setmayer. The Rick Wilson is traveling. He will be back next week. So when I say The Breakdown goes undercover, not quite. Tonight we have investigative reporter, political reporter, Lauren Windsor with us, and she does go undercover. And she seems to get Republican candidates to say some very interesting things. She's been exposing a lot of their hypocrisy. She's been all over the country from Wisconsin and Ron Johnson to Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, which is where we have our most interest right now. Um, but And also some other things in between. She has a story that uh, broke tonight um, on John Eastman. Remember that guy? the January 6th coup memo guy. Yeah, she's got a video that they just posted and we're going to talk about that tonight and what the breaking news is there. So stay tuned for Lauren Windsor. She will be joining me in a few minutes. But first, some headlines. A couple of things have happened since we were all together last uh, on Thursday. Um, First off, we've got some January 6th news. The Rolling Stone magazine has done a uh, rather interesting... Um, news breaking story on the role that members of Congress may have played in the planning of the January 6th insurrection. Now, is this news to many of us who've been following this? No, not really, because we knew that there were members of Congress who were likely involved in this whole thing. Um, But there has, this is the first time we've really had some definitive reporting on this. And it seems as though that there are a couple of cooperating witnesses that have come forward to the January 6th committee, and they're spilling the beans. And they're talking about how they were uh, involved in the rally planning and the protest planning, but they grew concerned when they saw that people like Ali Alexander and others were turning this into something um, a bit more nefarious. So they're singing like canaries. And um, will we? I don't know if we'll see public testimony from them, but the Rolling Stone article uh, revealed some names that sound familiar. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Congressman Biggs, Mo Brooks, Gosar. These are all members of Congress who they say that were in contact with these folks. They were either planning or their staff was in contact with them. Um, And um, they're willing to go under oath and talk about it. So more to come on that story. We're going to keep an eye on this. But Thursday's show, we're going to break that all down with my good friend and friend of the show, 30-year veteran federal prosecutor, Glenn Kirshner. He's been on the show before. Um, he's fantastic. And he has some theories about what's going on. And we're going to break this whole thing down, including that Rolling Stone story and some more information that's coming out with him on Thursday. So uh, check back with us then on that. But other headlines going on. Well, over the weekend, we had uh, dueling political rallies here in Virginia. You had Glenn Youngkin and uh, Terry McAuliffe. You know, it's the final week and a half of campaigning where things kick up. They're in, uh, you know, they're in high gear now, and um, we had a, we had some other <laughs> things going on uh, besides that rally. So let's talk about first before we talk about Virginia. Let's look at the last week in the Republican Party. First, look at it right now. Let's reminisce. <laughs> Vote against the man who dishonored our past by selling my bedroom. Was election day an insurrection? You know, I think the election was what it was. Australia currently, make no mistake, is a tyrannical police state. Its citizens are quite literally being imprisoned against their will. So when do we deploy? I think what's significant about this is that Donald Trump found his way to enjoying the White House. I think you would agree with that. Yeah. Spend many a weekends there when a lot of people- We also worked through the whole weekend. I agree with that also. The upcoming holiday season is already being referred to as Biden's Blue Christmas. Let's go, Brandon. I yield back. Let's go, Brandon. We are living now through a modern digital civil rights movement. You could call me the new Rosa Parks. The left is desperate to continue the pandemic. You're putting eggs in people's bodies. 
It's an egg that hatches into a synthetic parasite and grows inside your body. I talk to the president all the time. I talked to him that day. I, I, my understanding is, from my memory, I talked to him after the attack happened and we were moved to the, to the chamber. I may have talked to him before. I don't know. But all, all I'm saying is, that had no, I had nothing to do with any of this. So that, 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 that to me is just... Washington Post called me a gun-toting calendar girl. And Politico magazine said that I was the Lady Trump. And I don't care. Ban vaccine mandates. Ban critical race theory. And stop voter fraud. That's not from Saturday Night Live. That's not from The Onion. That was real. These people are out of their freaking minds. I don't even know where to start on that. From the guy that said that we're that the vaccine is hatching parasitic eggs in us to the 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 you know Tits McGee over there in Nevada running for governor. What the hell is that? To the the idea that Trump was in the White House every weekend and loved it there and how he worked through the weekend. What reality do these freaking people live in? It's, it's, I'm telling you, we have to laugh from, from not crying, but unfortunately there are millions of people out here who watch these news sources and believe this bullshit, but we are here to sift through all of that and break through all of it because we know that it's a bunch of BS and we tell the truth here at the Lincoln Project to the breakdown. I just, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to fathom that people say this with a straight face. Um, and one other thing, a little on a more serious note, if you caught in there, this let's go Brandon BS that's going on now also. I was like, what the hell is this? Let's go, Brandon. I felt very boomerish, even though I'm a Gen Xer. But then I found out what this is actually about. So I guess a couple weeks ago, for those who don't know, there was a NASCAR race. The guy who won, his name was Brandon. And the interviewer heard these chants going on in the background where they were actually saying, fuck Joe Biden. And so in a, you know, she quickly said, oh, they're chanting, let's go, Brandon, as a way to kind of cover for the fuck Joe Biden chant. And now the right has jumped on this. The Trumpers have jumped on this. And we are hearing these let's go Brandon cheers everywhere, uh, including on the House floor. You know, I I just think that's so tasteless and low class. Like, what are we doing? You know, this, could you imagine, you know, I was in Congress at a time when a member of Congress yelled out, you lie. When President Obama was talking about Obamacare back in 2000, I think it was 2009 or 2000, 2009, Joe, Joe Wilson. And people were really upset with that. You know, it was disrespectful. It was against the decorum of the House. And we need to, you know, uh, raise the debate. And even members of Congress on, on the Republican side were critical of Joe Wilson for being disrespectful of the office of the presidency. Where is that decency now? There is clearly no bar too low for Republicans and the level of discourse, the performative politics that has overtaken the, the, our, our political discourse is, is a slippery slope to chaos. And that's what they want. We can't allow that. You know, earlier today, I actually tweeted something out about Kirsten Cinema. So I'm an equal opportunity criticizer here where it comes to lack of decorum and why I think that that's important to, to point out that we need to really stop this. Um, you know, Kirsten Cinema for all the criticism that she's getting for, you know, her stance on the Build Back Better and, you know, reconciliation bill and all of that, you know, she uh, she's a very uh, eclectic character. She's very eccentric and she dresses pretty funky and it's OK, you know, to a certain degree. But she was she's a senator. She's a United States senator. And she was presiding over the Senate chamber tonight, uh, today in a jean jacket and a T-shirt. And I had to look twice because I was like, wait, what? I'm sorry. However you feel about Congress, about the Senate, the Senate is still the greatest deliberative body in the world. There's a certain amount of respect that you should have for the office you hold and for our traditions. I mean, if you were if you were walking to a bank and you were looking for a business loan and you saw someone in a cutoff jean jacket and T-shirt as your loan officer, would you would that be appropriate? I don't think so. So I just thought it was inappropriate and tacky and performative. What are you doing? And I just, I just think that there's, there's criticism to go around on both sides. You know, Kirsten Cinema, don't preside over the Senate again in a jean jacket. And you know, Jim Jordan, put on a damn sport coat and a tie when you're in Congress. So I'm, I'm just maybe I'm that's the, 
traditionalist in me and working in Capitol Hill for many years that I just don't like to see certain norms broken like that, but have some respect for the office and the chamber and the people that you represent. So I feel about that. So equal opportunity, curmudgeon on that. Um, but that just leads me to some of this other stuff that's going on here. You know, we're seeing what's happening in Virginia and we see that uh, how close this race is. And Glenn Youngkin has done a very good job of trying to paint himself as someone who's just a regular guy in his vests and, you know, and he's not a Trumper. And, and but he's the enthusiasm gap that's happening between Democrats and Republicans here in Virginia is concerning. And some of the polling has shown that for McAuliffe's campaign. So, you know, they brought in the big guns, not Trump, though. We have a sneak peek for of a new ad coming up at the end of the show about why Trump isn't in Virginia? Hmm. Stay tuned for that. But one of the biggest guns you could possibly bring in was here in Virginia. President Obama took notice. Terry McCall needs a little boost. And Obama's just so good at it. Take a look. But when your supporters hold a rally where they pledge allegiance to a flag that was flown at the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, Hey, the, the, the biggest threat to our democracy in my lifetime. When you don't separate yourselves from them, when you when you don't think that's a problem, well, you know what? That's a problem. Either he actually believes in the same conspiracy theories that resulted in a bomb, or he doesn't believe it but he's willing to go along with it, to say or do anything to get elected. And maybe that's worse. The Lincoln Project paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertisement. You know, uh, President Obama nails that. And, you know, we at the Lincoln Project wanted to point that out because that's really what's at stake here. That's the message that Democrats need to get across in the final days of this campaign, because it's true. Which side are you on, Glenn? You can't be on both sides. You can't serve two masters. You can't play footsie with people who are pledging allegiance to an insurrection seditionist flag. You know, and I have to tell you that here I, where I live in Northern Virginia, there is for every one McAuliffe sign, there's four Yunkin signs. You know, it's just anecdotal, but it just shows you that there has got to this enthusiasm gap is real and there's still time, though. This is a, uh, it's still a week out. We're one week away from the election and get, whoever gets out the vote and it gets to the polls, the most wins. Bottom line. And there's still an opportunity to stop this momentum because Glenn Youngkin has the momentum. And I have to say something else. I didn't realize how close the race was in New Jersey or my home state in New Jersey. You know, same thing there. You know, Democrats were kind of taking it for granted that Cittarelli out there, the Republican con uh, Republican candidate, was didn't have a shot. A month ago, he was down 13 points. Now it's within six. So pay attention, everyone. Do not take anything for granted. Do not underestimate the enthusiasm of the crazies on the other side. So there's still time. If you live in these places, please go out there and and vote because come 2024, you don't want either one of the Republicans governing over their states and making decisions on the presidential election, because that's actually what's at stake here. So talking a little bit more about what's at stake here, I want to bring in my guest tonight because she's out there doing intrepid undercover work, Lauren Windsor. She is the creator of the political web show, The Undercurrent, and she goes undercover to expose the Republican hypocrisy out there, and there is no shortage of it. Lauren, welcome to The Breakdown. Thanks for having me, Tara. So um, I started off the show mentioning your latest uh, escapade exposing John Eastman. And he's the guy who was the author of that January 6th coup memo, um, basically laying out in his mind a legal argument to justify trying to overturn Joe Biden's election. And um, this, this is, um, I presume, will be the subject of a lot of what the January 6th committee it will be examining um, you have a lot of cases going on right now in the in the criminal justice system um, of people who were violating the law that day uh, on uh, at the Capitol. But John Eastman is an interesting character. And so tell us a little bit about uh, your latest story, what you broke today. Well, so um, John Eastman, just for context for everyone here, um, 
you know, beyond being the author of the coup memo, you know, came out last week in an interview with the National Review, um, you know, saying that, uh, you know, his memo was more of an exploratory uh, a- activity he was asked to do and that the reasoning, the legal reasoning wasn't really valid. It was just an exploration of uh, the possibilities. So he's trying to distance himself from his own memo. And um, his institute, the Claremont Institute, uh, so he was getting so much flack. Claremont came out in, in his defense saying that, you know, he was never intending to overturn an election. This was all about exploring possibilities, like a- answering constitutional questions. And so um, the, the Claremont Institute had its annual gala in Huntington Beach on Saturday. And so I went and spoke with both the president of uh, the Claremont Institute, Ryan Williams, and with Eastman. And it was pretty clear from both of those conversations that they were definitely on board with uh, trying to overturn the election. I think we have a clip uh, from what you posted earlier tonight from part one. Let's take a look. We're huge Trump supporters, and we were actually at January 6th. Oh, yeah. We saw your Did speech. I, saw your speech. Should I incite you to go down to the Capitol and riot? You actually incited us to become supporters of Claremont. Oh, good. Very yeah. good. Very good. Because, you know, and the work that you're doing is just so critical to saving our democracy. Thank and it was you. like, we couldn't not support your work after that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very yeah. kind of you. So, thank you. You're, you're really doing the Lord's work. Well, and I, you know, uh, that's my old, I, you heard me say it. My old professor said, if you're not catching incoming flack they're not over the target and my god I must be directly over it because yeah. I, I don't think there's anybody catch as much incoming flack maybe than other than Trump himself that I have over the last six months I mean it's amazing <laughs> he just thinks it's a big joke and oh did I incite you to go down to the Capitol riot <laughs> yo it's not a fucking joke to all the police officers that got hurt and maimed and almost killed and some who did lose their lives like this is not a fucking joke I, I have no patience for these people but go ahead <laughs> well I mean uh, you know the Claremont president first thing we said when we said the first thing he said when we said that we were at January 6 was glad you weren't indicted and I'm just like, this is the response that you have to someone telling you that they were, you know, at the Capitol on January 6th. Clearly, um, we know where your uh, real motivations lie. So Yeah, no kidding. And, you know, for those who are unfamiliar with your work, um, explain to them how, because you, you hear on the, on the video, you know, they're like, you, you say, oh, we're supporters. And, you know, you're kind of, you know, blending in so that you get them to be relaxed and talk. But some people may be a little critical and like, well, wait a minute. How is that kind of, you know, like entrapment? Like explain about w- what you're doing and how that is, you know, it's ethical. Well, so um, I do get that criticism a lot, and uh, I'm often compared with James O'Keefe, which is you know not a comp- comparison that I think is valid uh, right. for several reasons. Do I think that what Project Veritas does is unethical? Yes. Um, why? Because they're you know implanting um, political spies into organizations of their ideological opponents, like working for them in an agency capacity. So what I do is I go to events and talk to people um, in, you know, usually pretty open settings. So, you know, to, and, and I'm going after people who are elected officials or, you know, uh, have very close proximity to power. So I'm not going after low level staffers of uh, campaigns or, you know, uh, conservative Republican organizations. You know, I, I do think that there's ethical lines that have to be drawn. But if, if you're in a public setting, uh, I, I think that it's fair game to have a conversation with you, uh, particularly when the consequences of your actions really do uh, affect a, a huge number of Americans. I mean, it's our democracy at stake here. So right. I think that, um, you know, uh, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, but I definitely have a very clear ethical lines and I'm happy to defend my work any day to anyone. Good. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to explain that because I know Project Veritas is what people uh, oftentimes will say, well, what about them? That's not, how's it any different? And um, that's, they've been in the news recently. Um, The term political spies came directly from (laughs) James O'Keefe himself. There was a court order that said that, uh, well, you used it in your book, so you can use the terms because they're under, they're under, 
they're in trouble for some of the stuff that they have done. And James O'Keefe has been convicted in the past of some of for some of the things that he's done. So I wanted to give you an so that story. Actually, that story actually involves uh, the lawsuit that my firm is engaged uh, in with Project Veritas. So Project Veritas infiltrated our office in 2016. Um, in uh, an effort to uh, really burrow into the DNC and uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, mm -hmm. to, it, it wasn't an operation against our firm as much as a vehicle to uh, take down Hillary Clinton. Is that what inspires you to, to uh, do it for good as opposed to what they do? It's to say, wait a minute, maybe they're onto something, but we can do it in a more ethical way. <laughs> No. So, I mean, I've actually um, been doing this web show since uh, 2012, uh, launched with the Young Turks Network. I did uh, a little bit of undercover reporting going to Koch Brothers conferences and Alec conferences. Mm. And so at, at that time, it was really like, I'm going to report in a straightforward fashion um, the majority of the time, you know, just showing up at political events and asking questions of electeds, you know, straightforwardly, like with a camera, with a mic in situations where it's really impossible to do that, you know, because sure, it's, it's a closed setting. It's closed to the press. Um, you know, I, I, you know, to me, that was something that was worth, you know, trying to uh, get information uh, out of those situations because, you know, closed door conferences like Alec and like the Koch brothers retreats, you know, they're incredibly influential to the political process. Absolutely. And th these are settings where, you know, getting any information that you can, um, you know, can really have a, a, a big impact on uh, what legislation, like exposing um, the influence on legislation that's that's coming out. So, right, I, so I've done it in the past, like prior to 2016, prior yeah. to our lawsuit in 2017. It's just that post 2020 election, it was really um, clear to me that in order to get to the truth of, uh, you know what people are doing to overturn our democracy, to really uh, mm -hmm. destroy the fabric of our, our civic institutions. Um, it was clear to me that, that going undercover uh, was a much better methodology to do that. But, you know, I, I still do straightforward reporting. You know, I was, I was up on the Hill um, talking uh, to both Republicans and Democrats about the reconciliation bill uh, just a few weeks ago. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So um, I, I'm glad to see that you're doing this work because it's not easy to do. Um, and But there's so much. I mean, the breeding ground for the bullshit that's out there is plentiful. And so when you, you know, step into these environments and you get these nuggets, because these people are very pleased with themselves, as we saw just in that clip. And I encourage you guys to check out Lauren's um, uh, Twitter feed. You can see other examples where she has... Um, had conversations with these Republicans and just they are, you know, happy to say what they really think as opposed to what they say when they're in front of all the cameras or in an interview or in a campaign commercial. It's some it's oftentimes very different. Um, and we saw that with uh, Glenn Youngkins to, to pivot to what's happening here in Virginia. Um, part of what's going on here in Virginia is part of this plan that you have talked about that the you know that the John Eastmans of the world and some of these other um, you know folks are putting out there that this is their bigger plan to kind of um, snatch raw political power for Republicans and for the for the Trumper more Trumpy Republicans not the establishment because we hear him go after Mike Pence as he's the establishment Mike Pence was the, he's the bad guy because he actually followed the Constitution talk a little bit about that bigger scheme and how that applies to what happened here and what's going on here in Virginia with Youngkin. Well, so I do want to be clear though that I think that when we talk about establishment Republicans um you know, or, or Mike Pence being an establishment Republican, having like saved the right. um, the election or whatever. Um, that loosely. You know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the reporting has really come out. And, and I interviewed Pence myself. And um, I'm so you sorry. Know, I, I, well, in, in an undercover capacity in uh, Nebraska, I guess it was a couple months ago at this point, I'm kind of losing conception of time in the <laughs> pandemic. But, um, you know, I asked him why he didn't fight harder for President Trump. And, you know, he said that it was not possible, um, you know, he was following the Constitution, but part of his answer was really telling in that he was talking about, um, you know, uh, there was no state that put forward an alternate slate of electors. And so that to me was like, 
kind of a clue that had a state actually put forward an alternate slate. Right. That um, that was his out. And it, and it was just days later that uh, the news came out that Dan Quayle had told him, you know, absolutely not. You don't have the power to do this. And so um, it just shed more light on Pence's thinking. And, you know, next time around, uh, you know, I think that really is the path is that they will be putting forward alternate slates of electors. So in some of the video that hasn't been released on Eastman, he talks about how um, they really have to, you know, he was on a call with um, Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump with like 300 state legislators. And he called the state legislators spineless, uh, like spineless cowards. And that, uh, you know, the only way that they, he sees an opportunity is to like primary them in uh, 2022, like primary them uh, ahead of 2024. So, you know, they're working at the state level to really make sure that next time uh, yep. things go their way. We can't emphasize that enough. That's why, I, you know, I'm sure a lot of our supporters are like, why are you guys obsessed with Virginia? We're like, because this is a microcosm of what they want to do. You know, if you have someone like a Glenn Youngkin who is actually spineless because he didn't stand up to the Trumpers and their nonsense, but he's trying to make himself look like a Mitt Romney establishment Republican, like an actual establishment Republican, so that he's palatable to these folks. Well, the next thing you know, how do you know he's not going to succumb to the political pressure of the Trumper people in 2024 when it's time to, uh, you know, they have this, you know, this uh, changing in the slate of the elector, the electors and all of this, like the shenanigans that they're, they're trying to, um, prime themselves for in 2024 like it seems like it's far away but it's really not and it's really really serious with like this is a real plan that the republicans are trying to do state i mean nationally nationally in the states it, it, some of my reporting um from back to may june you know um, we were going out to arizona to uh, cover the audit there and you know spoke with uh matt gates marjorie taylor green paul gosar and it was clear then, you know, the it wasn't ever going to be just an audit in Arizona. They right. were using uh, Arizona as a template to launch audits across the country. Yep. And so I talked to Paul Gosar about, you know, where can we do this next? What are the best targets? And, you know, initially he's like, we should do it in every state. But then, yes. but, but where are the ones that are most important? And, you know, the most important ones, obviously, were the ones that Biden won and Trump lost. And, right. <laughs> you know, you, you see now that, um, you know, in, in the subsequent months after that video with uh, Paul Gosar, that, you know, an audit launched in Georgia, an audit launched in Wisconsin, the Pennsylvania Republicans are wanting to do that. So mm -hmm. um, I think that the danger um, is really, uh, <laughs> it, it's a really credible threat and that we should not be taking lightly. Well, we are grateful for the work that you do. Um, keep up the great work. Uh, what do you have in store? What's next for the undercurrent? Well, so uh, we're still working through this. Is the, you know, in toto, the uh, Eastman video is like over eight minutes. Uh, and we're going to break it up into chunks because it's, you know, separate questions. It's just, I think that people, you know, have an opportunity to digest it more um, online. But um, the next installment of that, uh, Eastman talks about how the insurrection was a setup um, <laughs> and that CNN paid uh, $60,000 to an Antifa member to uh, videotape violence and that like uh, the FBI infiltrated uh, our people. He called the, the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers our guys. Wonderful. And, and they were infiltrated by uh, the FBI. That's the newest BS line, by the way, folks. It's that the FBI, the deep state, that's what that's what Louis Gohmert is uh, putting out there and some others questioning, um, oh, well, maybe there were some Trump people there. But it was the it was the it was the you know, the FBI and the deep state. Now they're they're trying to whitewash that part of it because there's so much video evidence to, to prove that it wasn't Antifa. They're off that now. Now it's the deep state. There's just uh, no end to how low they will go, as I said before. Lauren Windsor, thank you so much for joining us. I encourage everyone to follow you, follow the work of The Undercurrent, and um, we'll look for the next video. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. 
good for her. It's not easy to do. And, um, you know, I've been in the rooms with, at some of these events, um, back in the day. And I, I look back at some of these, uh, some of these people and I just think, what the hell happened to them? Was it always this nuts? I don't know. Maybe it was. And I didn't know. I don't know. Um, but it is important, like Lauren said, that we pay attention to what's going on here, that we try to run subterfuge into this Republican plan to try to overturn the election results in 2024, or even in 2022, folks, I'm telling you right now, this is the playbook. They are not going to accept the results of elections they lose, and they want to sow chaos. So we have a little bit of a, a tactic of our own at the Lincoln Project that many of you are familiar with, if you've been following us, which is our PSYOPs targeting an audience of one. Who is that? Well, that would be the retired blogger, the loser, the two twice impeached former president who lives in Mar-a-Lago. We have, um, we want to know, Mr. Trump, why, why aren't you coming to campaign in Virginia? Obama was here for, for Terry McAuliffe. Where, where are you? Here's a sneak peek of our latest ad. Oh, Donald, it's happening again. You made Glenn Youngkin. President Trump endorsed me the next day. Without you, he was nothing. You gave him power. And I thanked him for it. That's why Glenn Youngkin has banned you from coming to Virginia. He used you. He thinks you're a loser and you'll make him one too. You are not welcome. He's embarrassed of you. He wants you to stay away. Not invited. Far away. Loser. Glenn Youngkin, just another rhino stabbing you in the back. They're ashamed of you. The Lincoln Project paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertising. Yes, yes, yes. We The Whispers ads are back. We started them last year against Donald Trump. He sees them. He doesn't like them. It gets under his skin. It gets under the flip flap flop, as Michael Cohen calls his hair. He doesn't like him. So we've got that ad getting ready to run down there in Mar-a-Lago and see if we can uh, sow some, some uh, dissension here and get Get him to, I don't know, issue one of those things against Yunkin and throw it into chaos and get Yunkin to explain why why don't you want President Trump to come and, and campaign for you? Why wouldn't you? You love the guy, don't you? So we'll see. It'll be out tomorrow and on the TVs in Palm Beach. Before we go, um, I did want to take, I know we have a couple of questions from the audience. So um, before I go tonight, I wanted to take an audience question or two. What is the first one? This is from Chuck. There are many legal actions pending against Trump and the organization. It would be nice to know the status of the larger ones. So you're right, Chuck. There are several things going on here, um, and we are keeping track of a lot of them. But on Thursday, we're going to have Glenn Kirshner here, and he will be able to answer a lot of those legal questions because, like I said before, he spent 30 years as a federal prosecutor in Washington, D.C., so he understands all of that. So come back, tune in on Thursday, and we will answer some of those questions with Glenn Kirshner. What's the next one? James asks, what concrete steps are most important to protect our democracy? Well, I would say there's two things. One is to pay attention, make sure you're informed and know what's going on. And two, make sure that you vote and are engaged in your state and local elections. That is important because the only way to hold these people accountable is to vote them out of office, disempower them, because if they have no power, they cannot wreak havoc on our lives and destroy our democracy. Unfortunately, there are a lot more of them out there than we ever thought we would be dealing with. In the past, you only had one or two crazies. Now you have a whole party full of them. So the most important thing we need to do is make sure you're out there paying attention, informing yourself, and getting out there to vote. And make sure that your representatives are protecting your right to vote. Pay attention to what's going on in your state because there's a lot being done on the local level in front of people's noses to try to disenfranchise people from voting. So stay on top of it. And we will too. We're here to help inform you and help you to do that. Well, that's it for tonight's show. Thank you to Lauren Windsor again over at The Undercurrent. Make sure to follow her. And we have a message from Maya May about supporting the Lincoln Project. Be sure to check out We're Speaking tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And I'll see you on Thursday. Hi, I'm Maya May from LPTV's We're Speaking. Did you know Glenn Youngkin has a superpower? No, it's not scaring school children, though, yeah, he definitely does that. And no, it's not time traveling to the 1950s when the voting and reproductive rights of women and people of color were severely restricted, although he definitely loved that too. His superpower is shape-shifting. 
Youngkin can hide his extremism, but don't be fooled. He's as Trumpy as cheeseburgers and teensy tiny hands. The Virginia governor's race is down to the wire in the polls, but Trump, he's overwhelmingly unpopular in Virginia. That's why Youngkin's success depends on hiding his connection and similarities to the Trump mob. Well, the Lincoln Project won't let him hide anymore. We're unmasking Glenn Trumpkin before it's too late. But we can't do it without you. You are a part of this movement and you can make a huge difference in this race. Go to lincolnproject.us to find new ways to get involved and to donate. Evil villain Glenn Youngkin wants to remake Virginia in Trump's grotesque image, but we've got a superpower too. It's the power of truth, but we gotta bring it together. Thank you for being a part of the Lincoln Project. A big thank you to Maya May. And also this Thursday, we're doing a pumpkin carving reveal. If you're into, it's Halloween week, if you're into pumpkin carving, send us your pictures of your pumpkin carvings, your most unique ones, and we'll pick out a couple. We might show them on air. We might give you some Lincoln Project swag for our favorite. But if you're into the pumpkin carving, we are in my family. We get real serious with it, so I'll post my pictures too. But send us the pictures of your pumpkin carvings. We need to have a little fun and break up all of this doom and gloom about democracy. Send them to, tweet us, tweet us at hashtag ask the breakdown with your pumpkin folk pick pick pumpkin pictures that's hard to say all right we'll see you thursday send us your pumpkin pictures